हेलो एवरी वन अ वेरी 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 वॉम वेलकम गाइज लेट मी चेक इफ आई एम लाइव यस ऑल्सो हेलो एवरी वन द ऑडियो ऑल्सो सीम्स फाइन एब्सोल्यूटली फाइन इन फैक्ट ऑल राइट सो आई होप एवरी वन इज एबल टू हियर मी एंड सी मी इन एवरीथिंग एल्स Okay. All right, guys. So, uh, first of all, very warm welcome to the class. A very good morning, also. And I'm sorry uh, for starting the class a little late. I was actually facing some uh, OBS issue. It was not able to read my PPT. So I was trying to resolve that, but that has been done. And now we are live for the class. So let's start without any further ado. हम शुरू करते हैं फटाफट से. so guys uh, in the last class we had spoken about uh, the kushan empire and i had told you that in today's lecture i will be starting with the shark and the indo greeks now this might be a small lecture because uh, we don't have a lot to cover in them see there is a lot that you can cover there is a lot of information that you can cover but all of that information can't really be covered in just you know uh, one class or can't really be covered uh, all so we will be covering or focusing on the basic aspects of it all right so that's what we will do so without any further ado hum log fatafat se jo hai wo start kar lete hain and also i would request all of you to please uh, do join the telegram group uh, so that you can get regular updates regarding the classes fine at the same time you will also uh, get your notes from here so whatever chapters that we teach uh, you will get your pdf formats of notes here the link has been given and so is the scan code has also been given so you can choose whichever you want whichever is comfortable with you and you can uh, join the group but it would be good if you join the group because this is really going to help you in your preparations all right chill let's start so kushanas we have completed and i was going to start with the shark origin so i had did i did a little part of it yesterday but let's not uh, let's uh, just revise it once again so that it's not uh, going above our heads so the shark era origin the beginning of the shark era is related to the king chahatstana the period of the shark era falls So the beginning of the shark era is related to the ascent of King Chahastana. The period of shark era falls between eleven years and fifty-two years. This information has been retrie uh, ret retrieved from the inscription of Chahastana, uh, which we have found. So the shark. So with the decline of the modern empire, we will see the rise of various, you know, other empires as well. Okay, and the shark era uh, begins with the ascent of King Chahastana. Fine, and how do we know that this is the beginning of the shark era? We know this through an inscription. Fine, and these are the various time periods for which the sharkas have ruled. Okay, now. Scythians. So sharks were originally actually known as the Scythians. So please remember this. You can be asked a question about the sharkas, but the instead of sharka, they could use the name Scythian. So you should not get confused. Scythians were a group of Iranian nomadic pastoral tribes. Okay. So where did they belong to? They came from Iran, uh, in the second century BC. Uh, they were Central Asian nomadic tribes. from uh, and they were basically from chinese region okay so who are the scythians scythians are referred to a group of iranian nomadic tribes so nomadic tribes from iran the central asian nomadic tribes and people from the chinese region tribes from the chinese region so uh, the tribes from these three regions iran central asia and china these uh, tribal groups were referred to as what they were referred to as the scythians okay So they invaded present-day Kazakhstan, uh, and those were inhabited by the Scythians. This promoted the Scythians to move towards Bactria and Parthia. 
So what happened? The Scythians started moving towards Bactria and Parthia. And after defeating the Parthian kings, they moved towards India. The sharks which established themselves in India were known as the Indo-Scythians. Okay. And their Indian kingdom was larger than the Indo-Greek. So yes, they had a good influence over India. They had a very good influence in India. They actually ruled over a huge area also. Okay. So that was definitely there. Okay. So that was, uh, that was definitely there. So this is all about the introduction of the shakas so let's move ahead let's talk about uh, some other aspects and then we can clear some doubts together let's talk about the shark rulers i'm sure you are familiar with rudradaman one uh, he was the one who repaired the sudarshan lake and uh, he is actually one of the best rulers of the shark dynasty but we have other rulers also which whom we should know about first of all we have moise Moise, also known as Moga, was the earliest Indo-Scythian king. Okay, so we are talking about Moga. Now, this is from the Indo-Scythian part, as in he is from uh, the Indian side uh, of the shark ruler. He ruled over Gandhar, which is presently Pakistan and Afghanistan. He invaded Indo-Greek territories, but he was unsuccessful. His capital was at Sarkap, which is Punjab, Pakistan. Many coins have been issued by Moise have been found. They contain Buddhist and also Hindu symbols. The languages used in these were Greek and Karoshti because that is where they are coming from, guys. Please understand that this was their native language. So his son, Aziz I, acquired the remaining Indo-Greek territories by defeating Hippostratos. Fine. So yes, they had this, you know, long-going rivalry. Between whom? There's this wrong going rivalry between uh, the Indo Greeks. So, Moise did try to expand his kingdom by defeating the Indo Greeks, but he was unsuccessful in doing so. Fine. But then uh, we have you know, a lot of issues. Uh, we have uh, his, uh, his son, his son Aziz I. He was the one who acquired the Indo Greek territories by defeating Hippostratos. He was the Greek, Indo-Greek ruler. He was defeated by Aziz I and he acquired some of the territories. Now, they were very tolerant towards uh, Buddhism and they were also, I think, very much had accepted Hinduism. And how do we know this? Because in their coins, you can see all of the symbols here. Okay. All right. Moving ahead. Then we have Chahastana. So Chahastana, he was a shark ruler of the Western Shatrapa dynasty who ruled over Ujjain. Okay, so Chahastana, I already told you that this is uh, from his inscription only, we get to know about the shakas. Okay, so he was a shark ruler uh, of Western Shatrapa or basically a Western uh, shark uh, area and he ruled over Ujjain. The shark era has believed to have started after his accession. So it was after his accession. Now once he had entered the throne, it was considered that yes, officially it was the beginning of the shark era. Why was it officially the beginning of the shark era? Because it was only after him that the sharks were actually now being known for whatever they are doing. Okay. Uh, earlier they were an important dynasty, but not as important, not as known. So it was after his uh, ascension to the throne is it that they came to be known as a dynasty. Now, Ptolemy mentioned him as Tiasthenes or Testinus. He was the founder of the uh, two major Shark Shatrapa dynasty in the northwestern India. All right. The uh, Badhar Mukhas. The other dynasty was called Shatrakas and included the king Nahapana who was defeated by the Satvahana king Kautami Putrashi Satakani. Okay. So what all was his contribution? Now, first of all, so again, guys, this is a very important point that what has been, he has been mentioned by, as by Ptolemy. Ptolemy, unko kya mention karte? Wo aapko yaad rakna, that is equally important. You should remember this because, why should you remember this? Because this can definitely come. Just a second, guys. I'm sorry. I'm facing. I don't know. I'm facing some issues today. 
anyway so you should remember this point because this is important uh we have to know that what he was known in the greek mythology sorry not in the greek mythology what he was known by the greek rulers uh what he has been mentioned so he was known as theasthenes or testinus okay now so he was the founder of two major shakshatrapa dynasties in northwest india in the northwest india there were two dynasties which belonged to the shakshatrapa origin okay uh, there was one dynasty which was known as badhar mukhas fine uh, the other dynasty was known as shashatras which included the king nahapana as well now if you remember king nahapana was the one who was defeated by the satvana king shri gautami putra satakani all right so there are two major dynasties which are there in india particularly belonging from the shakshatrapa uh, area okay please let me know if you have any doubts in the first two slides otherwise we'll move ahead the live chat is open guys you can use the live chat and please let me know if you have any doubts okay there seems to be no doubt so let's move ahead on now let's talk about one of the most important rulers of the shak dynasty and that is rudhaman 1 now he is considered as the greatest of the shak rulers or like greatest of the shak rulers he was from the western chhatrapa dynasty obviously he came from uh, the western area so western chhatrapa dynasty fine so remember there were two dynasties so he was from the western chhatrapa dynasty his grandson was chahastana his kingdom included these areas were there in the kingdom so there was the konkan area there is narbada valley uh, there is kathiawar this is gujarat obviously other parts of gujarat and malwa he conducted the repair work of the sudarshan lake this is all actually being mentioned in his inscription and that is why he is considered as a very important ruler because he uh, you know uh, repaired the sudarshan lake fine he married a hindu woman and had converted to hinduism so even though he came from a different place altogether he uh, did marry a hindu woman and he had converted to hinduism and that is why you can see that his name is very you know very sounding very uh, hindu so if you using the term but it sounds very indian i would say theek okay? hai he issued his first long inscription in chaste sanskrit chaste means original form of sanskrit the most difficult form of sanskrit so when he issued his first inscription that was in sanskrit he took the title of maka shatrapa after becoming the king please remember this title whatever title he had taken maka shatrapa this was the title taken by him after he became the king now he maintained marital relations with the satvana so what do you mean by that so satvanas and the shakas they did intermarry fine vashishti putra shri satakani was his son in law but he also fought numerous wars with him now this is a little uh, i would say uh, weird that uh, vashishti putra shri satakani was his son in law means uh, rudhaman's daughter was married to uh, satakani but he also fought a few wars with him which i don't know is a little weird for me but i'm sure that happened in ancient india okay uh, but uh, he regained through a uh, conquest many of the territories that was previously under the nahapana ruler so if you just uh, 
in the previous uh, slide only i told you that the other dynasty was known as the shakshatras and included the king nahapana so he was defeated by whom he was defeated by gautami putra shri satakani fine so uh, so he won most of his territories uh, which were under the nahapana ruler he supported sanskrit literature culture and arts so as it is every very evident from his very first inscription that he was a ardent supporter of sanskrit culture literature and arts it was during rudradama's reign that yavan uh, yavan shwara the greek writer lived in india and translated the yavan jatak from greek to sanskrit so we have one of the major contributions that was made by rudradaman and that is that it was during his reign it is his reign that yavan swara he was a greek writer he lived in india he and translated yavan jatak from sanskrit to greek now why do you think they using the word yavan here guys okay the word yavan is being used because the greeks actually were referred to as yavan later on the status would also be given to afghans but early, at that point of time this status was given to the greeks okay so yavan jatak when we talk about yavan jatak is a jatak which basically talks about uh, the greeks in india okay so let me know if you have any doubts here uh, if there's any problem you can uh, put uh, get you can just put your doubts in the live chat Let me know if you don't understand any point, any doubts, anything. The live chat is open, guys. You can always put it there. Okay, so there seems to be uh, no doubts. Let's move ahead then. All right, let's talk about the decline of the Shakas, and then we'll start with the uh, Indo-Greeks. The Shaka Empire declined after uh, the defeat of after their defeat at the hands of the Satavana Emperor Gautami Putra Shri Satakani. The Shak rule in northwest India and Pakistan came to an end after the death of Aziz, when the region came under the Kushanas. In Western India, their rule came to an end in the fourth century AD, when the last Western Chhatrap Shak rule, Rudra Simha III, was defeated by Chandragupta II of the Gupta dynasty. So here we can see how the various dynasties have declined. All right. So the Shak Empire started declining after they have been defeated by uh, Satavana Emperor Sa Gautami Putra Shri Satakarni. Fine. The Shak rule, which was then in the northwest of India and in Pakistan, that came to decline after the death of Aziz, and once Aziz was dead, the entire area came under the rule of the Kushanas. Okay, in Western India, it came to decline when the last Western ruler, when the last ruler of the Western Chhatra, Rudra Simha won. He was defeated by the Gupta king Chandragupta II, or you can also call him as Chandragupta Vikramaditya. Okay, so these are the various ways in which the various dynasties of the Shakas have declined. So with this, we have finished our discussion on the Shakas. Fine, and now we will move on to see some of the Indo-Greek rulers of uh, the, uh, India, of particularly ancient India. So guys, you already know that how did we came in contact with the Indo-Greeks? So Alexander had this huge dream of conquering the entire world. He did set out for doing so. By the time he came to India, his uh, his army was really tired, and they were in no mood to fight. And hence, the 
hence the uh, the attack was quelled hence the attack was quelled but uh, yes there was a formation of some kind of uh, some kind of diplomatic relationship between the indo greeks and the indian rulers fine so this with this uh, you do uh, diplomat diplomacy theme with the beginning of this diplomacy you will see the rise of relationships between indo greeks and the uh, rulers in the indian rulers particularly it started with chandragupta maurya right he was the one who actually married the daughter of selicus nicator and also had a greek ambassador in his court called megasthenes who was the writer of indica so the the lectures sorry the relationship actually began from there and how it moved ahead that's what we will be focusing on chali aage badhte let's talk about the indo greeks so after the decline of the mauryas Northern India had split into several small kingdoms. In Magadh region, the Shungas have came to power. After that, the Kanvas came to power. Then they were defeated by the Satvahanas. Okay, Northwest was constantly under attack from the powers that were there in Central Asia. So it could either be the Shakas or it could either be some other uh, tribal community. The Indo-Greek or the Greco-Indian kingdom was established around. 180 BC, when the Greco-Bactrian king Demetrius invaded the Indian subcontinent. All right. So once the Mauryan Empire has declined, so till the Mauryas there was a diplomatic relationship between India and the Greek rulers. After the decline of the Mauryas, there were several small kingdoms that had come up in almost all of India. Fine. In Magadh region, the Shungas have come to power. In uh, after that, we have the Kanvas. They were defeated by the Satvahana rulers. Fine. Northwest was constantly under attack of whoever was there in power, particularly in Central Asia. The Indo-Greek or the Greco-Indian kingdom was established in 180 BC when the Greco-Bactrian king Demetrius invaded the Indian subcontinent. so after this invasion we will see the establishment of the indo greek rulers okay let's do some slides more and then we can clear some doubts together all right indo greeks let's talk about the initial presence so i already told you after alexander invaded the northwestern part of the uh, subcontinent one of his general selicus nicator was left behind and he founded the seleucid empire fine In Seleucus's conflict, the mighty Chandragupta Maurya he ceded large parts of the west of the Indus, including Hindu Kush, present-day Afghanistan, Balochistan, to the Mauryan king. So we all know that Chandragupta Maurya was a a very good warrior, guys. He was the best warrior possible, and he had taken a lot of territories. From the Seleucid Empire, Seleucid did establish an empire in the northwest, but Chandragupta had taken a lot of territories from him, particularly present-day Afghanistan and Balochistan. After this, Megasthenes was sent to reside in Chandragupta's court, and other Greek residents in modern courts were Demachus and uh, Dionysius. Okay. So these were some other residents. Please remember these names again. This is very important to remember the names of Demachus. Sorry, I'm so sorry, boys. Demachus and uh, Dionysius. Fine. Why is it important, guys? Because see, uh, in your MCQ, they can definitely ask you these names. Uh, because uh, Megasthenes is something everyone is familiar with. So they might ask you some other uh, names of other residents as well. Okay. The Greek populations lived in northwestern part of the uh, of the modern empire. as is evident from ashoka's edicts so when ashoka was writing his edicts in the northwestern part he always used uh, the language greek and aramaic mauryas also had departments to take care of foreigners like yavans and persians in ancient sources greeks have been referred to as yavans or and yonas okay so i already told you that how the greeks have been referred to as yavans uh, malech also because they are coming from a different land altogether not speaking the sanskritic language and neither are they uh, you know involved uh, in any kind of hindu religion fine so they were uh, you know given different names but mostly they were referred to as yavanas fine 
So uh, the Indo-Greeks were known as Yavanas and they had, you know, on and off again relations with the Mauryas. Uh, sometimes there was diplomatic relations, sometimes it was outright war relation. But yes, they did continue with their relations uh, during Ashoka's time also, during Chandragupta Mauryas time also. And all the Indian kings did try to keep them in a, sub in a subdued level. Okay, let me know if you have any doubts in these two slides. The live chat is open, guys. If you have any doubts, you can ask. Whatever doubts you have, you can put it in the live chat, guys. Up live chat with Dal Sakto. All right, no doubts, then we can move ahead. Uh, this we have done. Okay, let's talk about the Indo Greek kingdom now. Fine, the Indo Greek kingdom was ruled over by 30 Hellenistic Greek kings in the northwest and north India from 2nd century BC to the beginning of the 1st century AD. So, this is the time period in which they have ruled, okay? 2nd century BC to the beginning of 1st century AD. This is actually quite a long time. The kingdom started when uh, the Greco-Bactrian king Demetrius invaded India in 180 BC. He, con he conquered southern Afghanistan and he conquered some parts of Punjab. That's how they began their reign. This is where they began their reign. The Indo-Greeks imbibed Indian culture and became political uh, entities with a mix of Greek and Indian culture. So the Indo-Greek rulers, again, because they have become part of India, they've lived in India for so long that they actually became the part of Indian culture uh, and they followed a mix of Greek and Indian culture. For about 25 years, the Indo-Greek kingdoms were under the Ithumid rule, okay? Many coins have been unearthed of these kings and most information we get about them is from these coins. Coins have been found with Indian and Greek inscriptions. So uh, how do we get to know about the Indo-Greeks? Now basic, a major source of information about them is the coins. Many coins have been unearthed, many coins have been found. And whatever information we have about the Indo-Greeks, most of the information actually comes from these coins. Okay. So the coins have the coins which have been found have inscriptions in Greek and Indian languages. Many coins have been found with images of Indian deities also. Definitely, as I told you, they were a mix of Indian and uh, Greek culture. Absolutely. So the coins also have uh, the images of Indian gods and goddesses. The Indo-Greeks did this to perhaps placate the population, most of whom were not Greeks. So obviously you have to do this because you are ruling over a population who were not Greeks, absolutely not Greeks. So you have to make sure that they do not feel out of place, that they do not feel unwanted. And how do you do this? You do this by making sure that uh, uh, their uh, culture has been included in your administration. The civil war among many Bactrian kings of, uh, after the death of Demetrius facilitated the independent kingdom of Apollodotus I, who in this way can be regarded as the first proper Indo-Greek, all right, whose rule actually was not from Bactria. 
so there was a lot of civil war so in the greek into greek king who had come to india they would keep fighting amongst themselves particularly after the death of demetrius so and because of that this led to the uh, establishment of this independent kingdom called apollo dotus fine and apollo dotus can be regarded as the first proper indo greek king because he was independent in his own right he was not controlled by the bactrian rulers so he was not controlled by bactria he was independent in his own right okay so his kingdom included gandhar and uh, western punjab again a very huge area i would say most of the indo greeks were buddhist and buddhism flourished under their rule so you can see guys that you know most of the kings of ancient india accepted buddhism with open arms isn't it maybe because it was such a inclusive uh, tradition but yes most of the rulers have accepted buddhism with open art greek influences can be seen particularly in the gandhar school of art i already told you this yesterday when i was doing the gandhar school of art with you little bits in detail we have it on the details but i was doing the little bits with you so you already know that how the greeks have influenced because uh, their sculpture was actually uh, quite good and they influenced the gandhar school of art and how every fold uh, of uh, the sculpture would be visible okay so uh, let's let's move ahead let's do some few more slides and then we can clear some doubts together okay let's talk about menander now menander one stotter or sotter was known as menand menandra or melinda in pali so please remember these names they can ask you questions from any of these names guys theek okay? hai uh they can give you any of these names and then they can ask they will be asking you question about meander so he was initially the king of bactria his empire extended from kabul uh, in the west to ravi river in the east to swatwali in the north uh to uh, arkososia in the in afghanistan fine so he had a huge 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 empire dekha jaye to theek hai so it started from kabul valley uh in the west again pakistan ravi fine and uh, in the east swat valley in the afghanistan area so according to some indian sources he went as far as rajasthan and patliputra okay so he went as far as these areas and this is how the extent of this empire was so if he went as far as rajasthan and patliputra guys you can very well imagine that he had a huge empire isn't it now he converted to buddhism again you can see here and he did patronize the faith he did promote buddhism he died in 130 bc and he was uh, succeeded by his son strato 1 the milinda panha which is like a book which is composed it is a dialogue between milinda and the buddhist saint nagasena originally written in sanskrit only the pali version is now available in the work milinda is described as a wide learned king and in the end of it milinda accepts buddhism and converts to it so this is actually the story maybe or of how he converted to buddhism fine and it also gives us an insight into how what kind of ruler was he okay chali let me know if you have any doubts in these two slides guys the live chat is on you can just tell me if there's anything you don't understand Please use the live chat to let me know if there's any doubt that you might be having.
any doubts anything that you might not have understood please let me know live chat is open in these two slides okay chill let's move ahead so now guys as i uh, already uh, told you that one of the major sources to know about the indo greeks is actually from their coins isn't it so let's talk about the coins of the indo greeks and whatever we have found here so coins circulated to the north hindu kush during the indo greeks they were made of gold copper silver and nickel coins fine and the legends or the symbols were basically in uh, greek legends fine the indo greeks so on one side of the coin they would have royal portraits okay of greek deities like zeus apollo athena fine so on the indo greeks uh, there would be royal portraits fine royal portraits of whom royal portraits of the king okay so on one side of the coin there would be royal portraits of the king they were actually the first ones to issue coins with having the name and images of the king and on the other side there would be images of the greek deities like we have apollo zeus athena fine so coins circulated to the south of hindu kush during the reign of indo greeks okay so during the reign of indo uh, indo greeks the coins now started circulating south basically started coming towards india now they were silver and copper coins mostly they were square in shape they were not uh, circular in shape they were square in shape indian weight standards were followed to make this coins fine why indian weight standards were followed because obviously they had trade relations with india right and there was no exchange rate established at that time at that point of time guys so when there was no exchange rate established you have to make sure that your coin is the same weight as the uh, power that you are associating with or you're trading with so that even if you pay them in your own coins they can melt it uh, and they'll have the same amount of gold and they can use it to make their own coins okay uh the inscriptions on the coins would be bilingual either it would be greek or it would be karosti on the uh, so this i have already uh, told you that on the averse the royal portraits would be present and on the uh, reverse there would be religious symbols mostly there would be indian inscription the languages that would be used would be indian we already know why this was done this was done to placate the population isn't it the indian population who were mostly non greeks okay chali aage badhte hain let's uh, finish with the decline of the indo greek kingdom and then we would have finished the chapter we would finish today's lecture and we can clear some doubts there so the last indo greek ruler was strato ii he ruled over punjab till 55 bc some say it was till 10 ad they ruled invaded with the end uh, with the uh, invasions of the indo scythians the shakas which i have just taught you now fine it is believed that greek people lived for several centuries more in india under the indo parthians and the kushanas okay so the last uh, greek ruler was what his name was strato the third strato second he ruled punjab region so he was ruling over which area punjab region till 55 bc and some say it was till 10 ad and their rule ended when when the sharks invaded sharks of the indo scythians when they invaded their area and even though their power declined the indo greeks or the greek people did continue living in india for a very long time under indo parthians and the kushanas okay so with this we have finished our lecture on uh, today on the indo greeks and the shakas tomorrow we will continue with other ancient indian empires fine and a uh, next class i think i will be taking up buddhism and jainism once again because we have covered ncrt but we also need to cover some uh, other details uh, also of buddhism and jainism so we have covered some basic information from ncrt but we need to cover other uh, information as well so that is something we will be uh, doing so very uh, be prepared for that guys so tomorrow uh, we will have another session and we will be talking most uh, probably will we be talking about buddhism and jainism once again but this time in a lot more detail and different from whatever is there in ncrt
So if you could just take a look and let me know if you have any doubts in these two slides, uh, then we can move ahead. The live chat is open, guys. If there's anything you don't understand, you can always uh, just drop a message there. And for those who are uh, seeing this video after the recording, after the live session has ended, then also you can drop in your doubts in the comment section, guys. Take care. Uh, so that I will definitely take it up. I will definitely take a look at the doubts and take it up in the next class. Or if we have any doubt clearing sessions like that, I will take it up there. So just let me know if you have, if you're facing any difficulty here in these two slides. All right, guys, there seems to be uh, no doubts. Then I think I'm going to end today's session. And as I told you, we will be beginning with our next lecture tomorrow. We will most probably be talking about Buddhism and Jainism once again in a lot more detail. Again, before you guys leave, I would request everyone to join the Telegram channel. The link and the scan code both have been given. Why is this important? Because this is where you will get updates regarding the classes. All right. And you will also get notes. So, you will get two things here. You will get classes regarding updates. Plus, you will get notes here. You will get notes So, definitely you can opt for this. Fine. Apart from this, I would also request that before you all leave, please do like the video. Share it with your friends. Drop in a comment. Do tell us, let us know if there's something you don't like. Uh, we'll be more than happy to... Do you know, uh, correct it, we'll be more than happy to work on it. And if there's something you like, please don't uh, shy away from appreciating us because who does not like to be appreciated? So please do that. And also, guys, I would request everyone to subscribe to the channel and also press the bell notification because this is when you will get updates uh, whenever we post a new video. So it was a really awesome time to have you all on board. I will see you all in the next class. Thank you so much, guys. It was and it was a pleasure to have you all here. Thank you so much. All right, take care. Thank you. Bye bye.